Welcome to our lecture on cryptography. If you want to be a good cybersecurity specialist, you must have a good understanding of the fundamental concepts involved in cryptography. Cryptography is the study and application of methods and techniques to protect information by using codes for secure communication. So the bottom line in cryptography is to ensure secure communication between two parties. Cryptography is broadly categorized into two main categories, symmetric and asymmetric. We are going to start with symmetric encryption concepts. Symmetric encryption is also called private key encryption. And it uses the same key for encryption as well as decryption. And that is why it is called symmetric, because the same key is used both at the source and at the destination. It also uses the same cipher. Now cipher is a word which is an alternate for algorithms, is used for encryption and decryption. So the same algorithm is used at the source for encrypting data and the same algorithm is used at the destination for decrypting the data. Now key lengths determine the strength of encryption and usually the longer the better. Some popular private key ciphers include AES, RC5 and TwoFish. Let's have a look at how symmetric encryption actually works. So we have a source which wants to send data to a destination and it wants to encrypt that data before sending it. So at the source, we have a plain text file, which means it is unencrypted text and anybody can read it. So basically we use a key, which is kind of a secret code, which helps us encode this plain text. In addition to the key, we need an algorithm, which is basically going to take the key and the plain text data and it's going to do some steps, some operations, in order to provide us with the ciphertext, which is basically the encrypted text. So using the key and the algorithm with plain text as the input, we get a ciphertext as output. And this completes the encryption part. Now the basic aim of encryption was so that we could transmit data over the public internet without compromising its confidentiality. So that's exactly what we did. We converted plain text into ciphertext and then the ciphertext, which is basically encrypted data. And even if somebody gets a copy of it while it is flowing over the internet, they would still not be able to easily break it because it's encrypted. Now at the destination, the destination has received the ciphertext, which is the encrypted text. And the process now needs to be reversed. So at the destination, it needs to use exactly the same key which was used to encrypt the data. Consider it exactly like a numbered lock. So you really need to line up exactly those same numbers if you want to unlock it. So using the exact same key and using the exact same algorithm, we can decrypt this data so we convert the cipher text back into plain text. And this is called the decryption. And this is how the source is able to encrypt plain text data into ciphertext, transmit it over the internet, and then the destination is able to get back the plain text from the ciphertext. Perhaps the single most important factor which can determine the strength of encryption is the key length. The longer the key, the better. So let's say you have a password with X number of characters. For every character, you can select either from A to Z, which are basically 26 different alphabets or digits 0 to 9, which are 10. So 26 plus 10, 36 possibilities for each of these cells or each of these characters. But computers, they need digital numbers. They understand binary numbers. So we always talk about bits. So we talk about key lengths in terms of bits. Since we're talking about binary, so every cell or every bit can either be zero or it can be one. So if you have a key which spans n bits, then it means you have two raised to the power n different combinations possible. Let's have a look at a comparison table, which shows us how increasing key lengths make breaking encryption difficult. So let's say if you are selecting a key length of 56 bits, which means that you have two raised to the power 56 different combinations and using a good state of the art computer, you can break it in 20 hours. But if you increase the key length to 128, the possible combinations now jump to two raised to the power 128. And it would take five into 10 raised to the power 17 years to break it using the same computer. 
and say if you increase the key length to 256 bits then you have 2 raised to the power 256 different combinations which would take 7 into 10 raised to the power 56 years so nearly impossible to break so the bottom line that we need to understand is that it is always advisable and in fact recommended to use long key lengths A very popular and state-of-the-art symmetric encryption scheme is AES, Advanced Encryption Standard. It is so strong that it is even acceptable for military purposes. AES offers various key lengths starting from 128, 192 up to 256 bits. The key length determines the strength of the encryption, so obviously AES-256 would be considered stronger compared to AES-192 for instance. AES has several implementations and it's widely adopted in the industry and it is used in a large number of applications. The second category of encryption is called asymmetric encryption. Asymmetric encryption is also known as public key cryptography. Let us see how this works in real life. So again, we have the source which has a plain text document, which is unencrypted text and anybody can eavesdrop it. We use a private key, the secret code for encoding the data. In addition, we also use the algorithm. So we have the plain text data. We apply the private key using the cipher or the algorithm and we obtain the cipher text, which is the encrypted text. This completes the encryption part of public key cryptography. Now the cipher text is transmitted over the public internet and it reaches the destination. So now at the destination, we use a different type of key, which is the public key. Now it should be noted that the key difference in public and private key cryptography is the difference between these keys. So in symmetric encryption or private key cryptography, we used the same key for encryption as well as for decryption. But now we used a private key for encryption and we used a public key for decryption. So the two keys are completely different. And when we apply the public key, we get the plain text and this completes the decryption process. So the first question that naturally comes to mind is that how can you decrypt data that has been encrypted with a different key? And the answer is that we have some special mathematical operations which allow different keys to be used for encryption and decryption. The second question is that why do we need it in the first place? Why can't we just use symmetric encryption? And the answer is this. Say you want to connect to a remote server on the public internet and you want your end-to-end -end connection to be secure and encrypted. So for that you obviously need the same key at your end and at the server end. The problem is that how are you going to exchange this key with the server or how the server is going to send its key to you? Because if you send your key in plain text to the server or vice versa, anybody in the middle can eavesdrop on it. And there is no other way to encrypt it because for encryption, you both really need those keys. So that is exactly the problem solved by asymmetric encryption. So you don't need the same key at the two ends. So the way this works is that the server, it publishes its public key using digital certificates. So then you can use that public key to decrypt data sent by the server to you. And you can also use that public key to encrypt data that you want to send to the server. And since only the server has its own private key, that's why you are assured that nobody is going to decrypt it. So this is how asymmetric cryptography helps us resolve this problem of exchanging keys. So private key is used for encryption, whereas public key is used for decryption and private key is completely different from the public key. You should also note that data encrypted with the private key cannot be decrypted with the private key. It needs the public key and vice versa. So the magic is in special mathematical operations, which allow us to use two different types of keys. And this gives tremendous power for asymmetric encryption. So one of the reasons why we needed asymmetric encryption was because private keys cannot always be safely exchanged on public networks like the internet. So asymmetric encryption is required to create that initial trust, the initial encrypted end-to-end -end communication channel, over which you can even exchange symmetric keys and then use them later on for encryption or decryption. 
but for the initial secure and encrypted channel you definitely need asymmetric encryption another reason why you may want to consider asymmetric encryption is because symmetric keys are not really scalable so imagine if you are a user and you want to communicate with n different entities so you'll be requiring n different symmetric keys if you're using asymmetric encryption because you need a different key for a to one communication for a to two you need a different key and so on up to n so if you're talking to n people you need n different symmetric keys so imagine if you want to communicate with thousands of different servers you'll need thousands of different keys so it is obviously not a scalable solution now contrast that with asymmetric encryption so if you're using asymmetric keys you just need two keys and that's it so one is the private key which would be used by a and the second is the public key which is published to all the users and it is public so whenever a wants to send some data to any of these destinations one to n a is simply going to encrypt it using its private key and any of these destinations would be able to decrypt that data using the public key of a so this is a very scalable solution and the converse is also true. If one wants to send some data to A, it is simply going to encrypt it using the public key of A. And this data cannot be decrypted except for A because he has the corresponding private key. So this is how asymmetric encryption offers tremendous flexibility and scalability. Some popular asymmetric solutions include Diffie-Hellman, which is used for key exchange between two entities. We also have RSA which is used for actual encryption or decryption and we have ECC which is again used for actual encryption and decryption and there are several others available as well. A quick recap on the differences between symmetric and asymmetric encryption. So in symmetric encryption we always use the same key for encryption as well as for decryption. But in asymmetric encryption we use different keys private and public. In symmetric encryption, encryption and decryption algorithms or ciphers are exactly the same. But in asymmetric encryption, we have different encryption and decryption algorithms because we are using different keys for encryption and for decryption. A major problem with symmetric encryption is that it is not always possible to exchange keys safely because to start the encryption process, the two ends need to have the same key and there is no way to exchange these keys without incurring some sort of a risk. In contrast, asymmetric encryption can be done on public networks. In fact, it is designed for communication over public networks. One advantage of symmetric encryption is that it's very fast, whereas asymmetric encryption is a bit slow. And one of the reasons is because it's using different encryption and decryption techniques. Now, since symmetric encryption is very fast, so what we normally do is that we create the initial secure channel using asymmetric encryption but once that is in place we exchange symmetric keys or session keys and then we use symmetric encryption for quick and efficient encryption and decryption of data at the two ends but for the initial establishment of the trust of the secure channel we use asymmetric encryption and then within that tunnel or within that channel we can exchange symmetric keys as well another difference between the two encryption schemes is that for offering the same strength, symmetric key encryption requires smaller key lengths compared to asymmetric encryption. And this stems from the fact that asymmetric encryption is designed to allow for two different keys to encrypt and decrypt. So that's why we generally need longer keys in asymmetric encryption in order to provide the same level of safety as symmetric encryption. So that concludes our lecture. I'll see you in the next one.